بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا uh, continuing with our reading and commentary on Imam Al-Ghazali's book uh, 40 Principles of Religion today we begin with uh, the, print, the chapter on stinginess uh, the fifth principle in, in this section of the book for those that are following uh, in the book which is this translation that we're using it's page 140 so Imam al-Ghazali, he says, may we benefit from his knowledge in this world and the next. Know that stinginess is amongst the great destructive traits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever is protected from the stinginess of his self, these are the successful ones. Allah Ta'ala also says, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ يَبِخَلُونَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ هُوَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ بَلْ هُوَ شَرٌ لَهُمْ سَيُطَوَّقُونَ مَا بَخِلُوا بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Those who are stingy with what Allah has given them from His bounty should not think that it is good for them. Rather, it is bad for them. On the day of resurrection, they will be closed in by what they were stingy with. So see, notice in the verse how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, He says, if you are stingy with what Allah has given you. What has Allah given you? Everything, right? So that's, the, that's like the beginning and the end of this discussion of stinginess. Allah Ta'ala also says, those who are stingy and order people to be stingy. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, beware of stinginess for indeed it destroyed those who were before you. Meaning that this is also a disease of the heart that causes great calamity and social unrest and it breaks down the fabric of society because for those and, and stinginess is, of course is not just about um, money but it's also just about resources in general money being one of those resources so people communities that were stingy in the past uh, communities that did not share with the greater community uh, etc the idea is that this is the Prophet is saying is that this is one of the downfalls. The Prophet also said, liberality is a tree that grows in paradise, and no one except the liberally generous person will get into paradise. Stinginess is a tree that grows in hell. May Allah Ta'ala protect us, and no one enters hell except the stingy person. He also said, والسلام, there are three destructive things: stinginess that is obeyed meaning that you obey your, your own desire for stinginess. Caprice that is followed, you follow your own caprice. And a person admiring himself. He also said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the worst thing in a man is desperate stinginess and wanton cowardice. The Prophet sallallahu also said, verily Allah hates the stingy person in his life and loves the liberally generous person at his death. He also said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the ignorant, generous person, the ignorant, generous person, is more beloved to Allah than the dutiful, worshipful, stingy person, right? So it's not just about your acts, your, our acts of worship are more than just our prayer and our fasting and our zakat, right? The acts of worship, indeed the whole point of Imam al-Ghazali's, this book and the, the larger Ahya al din from which is taken is to show us that it's all this internal stuff. So look, the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, an ignorant person, a person who doesn't have much knowledge, who doesn't do much, but is generous, generous with their time, generous with their wealth, generous with their resources, is more beloved to Allah Ta'ala than the devoutly worship, worshipful, stingy person. Devoutly worshipful. So the person that's always praying, praying all the sunnahs, you know, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, all of those things, but they are stingy. So, and then the last hadith of the introduction, the Prophet ﷺ also said, stinginess and bad character are not combined in a believer. So that last hadith is very important because good character, this is what the Prophet ﷺ was sent for. The Prophet ﷺ said, I was only sent to perfect and refine human character. Now, I want you all to think about that hadith uh, just for a moment. And of course, as we progress uh, in the book, 
we will, you know, this is a theme that sort of will come essentially in every chapter, that these, these things that we've been talking about, you know, anger and love of money and stinginess and all of the other diseases he'll get into, these are all signs of bad character. And the Prophet Sallallahu he, he summarized his entire uh, prophetic mission to refine and perfect, improve and polish our character. So all of these diseases, all of these problems, these are not like some inconvenience that we just sort of, maybe when we have time, we need to work on it. This is the, the essence of, of what it means to be a believer. This is the essence of what it means to be a Muslim. It's the essence of what it means to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to refine our character. Okay, so he says now, moving into the subject matter at hand, know that the foundation of stinginess is love of wealth, which is blameworthy. The stinginess of someone who has no wealth does not appear through withholding. Rather, it appears through love of wealth. And perhaps a man is generous, yet loves wealth. Hence, he gives liberally so that he is remembered for generosity. This is also blameworthy because the love of wealth distracts from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turns the heart's direction to the material world, thus strengthening a person's relationship with it until death, through which he will meet Allah ta'ala becomes, becomes hard on him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhaladina amanu la tulhikum amwalukum O you who believe, do not let your wealth or your children distract, distract you from Allah's memory. So here Imam al-Huzali, he's telling us right, you know, right from the get-go, what's the root cause of stinginess is that you love wealth. But it's also not simply stinginess of holding on to the wealth because there are also people that give generously in order that, so their, their whole reason, reason behind giving is that so people will remember them for giving, which is also another form of love of wealth because wealth then becomes front and centered. My, my MO is wealth. Either I give or I hold my self-worth, um, the, 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 the reason behind all of my activities, the reason, you know, the, the way I think about everything is through this lens of wealth. So we want to break out of that so that we're thinking of God, not wealth. So we're thinking of, of our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because wealth and material things are, are, you know, we're surrounded by them, it's very easy that they can distract us. Allah ta'ala also says, fitna. Indeed, your wealth and your children are only a trial. He also says, The mutual seeking of gain has distracted you. Right? You're going to keep uh, gaining things and be concerned with things all the way until you put your feet into the grave. It's, it, it's from the beginning of your life to the end of your life, which is part of the human condition. So we can't live in the world without things. We can't live in the world without sustenance. So it's not about that the sustenance is bad. It's our concern for it and our um, eagerness to amass and our concern for it to the point that that becomes the definition through which and by which we define everything else. The Prophet Sallallahu said, do not take a villa and thus love the world, meaning that it would distract you. It was said to the Prophet Sallallahu which part of your community is the worst? He replied, the rich. He also said, whoever takes from the world over and above what suffices him has taken his death while he does not know. So wealth in and of itself is not the problem. Material gain in and of itself is not the problem. Material things in and of themselves is not the problem. It's that the more you have of that, the higher you're going to, you're going to push your standard of living higher and higher and higher. And if you push it too high, then you start to assume that what you have, you know, you start to judge this is essential. You know, but what's essential for an extremely wealthy person is not essential for somebody who's, you know, trying to get themselves out of poverty, for example. So Imam al-Ghazali, he's going to make the case and he's going to be very shocking in this chapter. He's going to tell us, let me tell you what essential means. A measure, you know, a, a ruler by which you can judge if you are living 
essential. A lot of this stuff is going to be hard, and it's meant to be hard. It's not meant to be necessarily easy, but it gets us thinking about can we consume less? Do we need all the things that we need? Are we able to live less than with what we have? So on and so forth. And these are very, very healthy questions because you know what happens when you gain something, a material thing, it's very easy to become attached to it. It's very easy to, it just, it just glitters you know, in front of you. It's like you buy this shiny thing and you place it in front of you and you're always looking at it. And then therefore you're not looking at the other stuff. So it's very easy to slip into that, especially in the society in which we live, which we're so uh, you know, surrounded by so many things and the ease of acquiring things, you know, so on and so forth. So these are important questions for us to ask, even on a daily basis. Do I really need this? Do I really have to get this? Do I really have to have this? Because it starts for forcing you to answer that question. It's not a rhetorical question. You have to answer it for yourself. And you have to go that, through that process of thinking. A man said, O Messenger of Allah, I certainly do not like death. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you have any wealth? He said, yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, give up your wealth, for a man's heart is surely with his wealth. If he gives it up, he wants to catch up with it. If he holds it back, he likes for it to stay behind with him. The Prophet ﷺ also said, when the slave dies, the angel said, I meaning when a person dies, the, the angels say, what did he put forward? The people say, what did he leave behind? See, the, the, the measuring stick in the akhirah, what did you do for the akhirah? The measuring stick in the dunya when somebody dies, well, what did they leave behind? What are the things that they used to do? It's very funny because as, as humans, we have almost the, the, the reverse thinking. We want to be thinking forward thinking. Okay, I'm going to do this now, but how is this going to impact my akhirah? That also sobers you up, that type of question. The Prophet Sallallahu also said, the slave of the dinar has perished. The slave of the dirham has perished. The dinar is the gold coin and the dirham is the silver coin. And that was the currency at the time of the message of the Prophet Sallallahu The slave of the embroidered garment has perished and suffered repeatedly. And if he is pricked by a thorn, it is not removed. Okay, so the slave of those things, not that those things are bad. You need the dinar and the dirham and the embroidered clothes to live a decent life. It's not that those things are bad. It's our attachment to those things. That's the key. So I don't want people to take away from this chapter that having things is bad. And, I, and I'm going to strip down and just wear the same thing every day. Not like I have 50 of the, this Sweatshirt, now I'm going to wear just this sweatshirt, you know, then you're going to start to stink and, and we're not going to let you in the mosque. So we're not talking about, um, you know, there will be lessening of things. I, I don't, I also don't want people to think that that's not going to happen. If you take this seriously, you will end up, inshallah, consuming less, having less. But I don't want people to think that it's the acquisition of things themselves that's the problem. It's our attitude and our attachment to it. So he'll, he'll, go, he'll go, he'll walk us through that. Okay. The reality of wealth in respect to blame and praise. Know that wealth is not blameworthy from every aspect. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, How excellent is the useful wealth of a righteous man. He also said, وسلم, The world is a field for cultivating in the afterlife. How could it be absolutely blameworthy when the slave is a traveler to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The world is one stop along his journey. And his body is a vehicle without which it is impossible for him to travel. It cannot survive without food and clothing, and there is no way to them except through wealth. And that's what's key. There's a difference between the dunya and al haya. Al haya is life. We have to live in this life. And life requires things. It requires food and drink and rest and clothes and travel and family and relationships. And that's good because as the Prophet said, that those are the places where you're going to plant your seeds and they're going to harvest them yom al qiyamah. The dunya, that's what's blameworthy, our attachment to those things. So let me just read that sentence again. It cannot survive, life cannot survive, and our journey to Allah cannot survive without food and clothing. And there is no way to them except through wealth. However, anyone who understands the benefit of wealth, knowing that it is a tool for freedom, 
The beast of burden in order to traverse the path never turns his attention toward it, nor does he take from it anything besides the amount he needs for his journey. If he limits himself to that, he is happy with it, as the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha salam, If you want to meet up with me, then be content with the traveler's provision from the world and do not get a new garment or discard an old one until you wear holes in it. The Prophet ﷺ also said, Oh Allah, make the food of Muhammad's family only what they need to subsist. And this is one of the qualities of Ahlul Bayt, the, 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 the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, especially the early, the early generation of the Prophet ﷺ, even his own, his daughter and his grandchildren, they lived a financially modest life. These were not wealthy people, uh, but they had enough what they needed. They, they, did, they were not you know, begging and you know, impoverished, but they had what they needed to subsist. And that's why they accomplished unbelievable, unbelievable things. On the other hand, if a person exceeds the sufficient amount, he is destroyed as the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever takes from the world above what suffices him has taken his death and is destroyed without even feeling it. Because you, you take so much, it weighs you down and then you just sort of, you drown in those things. So think about when you're traveling uh, and you, you have a journey that's very long and you have to make these stops along the way. Either you're traveling by car, you got to stop and you know, fill up gas and get some food or something, coffee, whatever to, to keep going. Or you're traveling and you actually go to other cities in transit to a, a larger destination. You know, when you're in transit or you stop at the rest stop or the gas station, you know, you're not going to go shopping for like six hours. You're going to get what you need to get going because you have a journey. That, that example is exactly what Imam al-Ghazali is talking about. This dunya, our life, is like that journey. So sure, you're going to need things, and you need decent things, and you need things to survive, but you're only going to really take what you need. If you take more than what you need, you're going to distract yourself from the journey at hand. Likewise, is the traveler, if he takes more than what he needs for the road, he will die under its weight, like physically, like if you're traveling by camel and you have too much like baggage, the camel will buckle and never reach the destination of his travel. Adding to the sufficient amount is a destructive thing from three perspectives. One of them is that it calls to act of disobedience and puts one in a position to commit them. Whereas it is from divine protection that one is unable to commit sin. The trial of ease is greater than the trial of hardship and having patience when one is able is much more difficult than when one is unable. The second is that it calls to indulging in permissible things at the least. Then a person's body grows out of indulgence so that he is incapable of forbearing without it. Such a lifestyle is impossible to maintain without the support of the creation and turning to wrong, uh, wrongdoers for help. That calls to hypocrisy, lying, ostentation, enmity, and hatred. A host of destructive things stem from it. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ said, love of the world is the head of every transgression. The third is that it distracts, it distracts from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the basis of happiness in the afterlife. For it crowds the heart with disputes of farmers, keeping account of partners, thinking of cautionary plans concerning them, planning how to increase wealth, how to first acquire it, preserve it secondly, and thirdly, make use of it. All of this is from amongst those that blacken the heart, remove its clarity, and distract it from remembrance, as Allah ta'ala says, al hakim al takathur the mutual seeking of gain has distracted you. So if you're around people that are very wealthy, uh, usually what you will find is that all their talk is about wealth. It's about investing and it's about, you know, this uh, IPO and this new idea and how to start a business and how to succeed and, you know, what my, you know, routine is in the morning so I can focus more and when I invest my money, it's all related around the money. And I'm not saying... Uh, I lost the page. I'm too excited. I lost the page. Just one second. <laughs> so, um, I'm not saying that, again, uh, the, uh, the amassing of wealth and the making of money, as he says in the beginning, can be a wonderful thing for a righteous person. It's about the person. One of the things that uh, you find with wealth is that wealth doesn't really change people. It only emphasizes what was already there. If somebody is good at heart, their wealth will empower their goodness. If somebody was not good at heart, the wealth only empowers that selfishness. So when you see wealthy people, 
and you find out that their lives are messed up or whatever, it's not necessarily the wealth that's, that's they were like that all along, but the wealth has enabled them. And therefore they live all these scandals in the public life, you know, because as a public we're obsessed with wealthy people. But had they not had that wealth, they probably would have had just a smaller version of those problems, right? So the goal is to correct what's in here first, because if Allah Ta'ala so chooses for one of us that, you know, we become super wealthy or we become moderately or whatever, we also want to be prepared for that responsibility. And that's also important because Allah is the one who, who bestows, Allah Razak, he's the one that, that, that passes out and allots the sustenance. So some people will become wealthy, extremely wealthy, or some people will become moderately wealthy, or some people will be wealthy and they'll be poor, wealthy, poor. The point is that we want to be prepared for, what's that, for, for that by preparing the heart. Perhaps you, do, you desire to know the sufficient amount and say there is no rich person who does not claim that what he possesses is a sufficient amount. That's what I was talking about earlier. The, the wealthier you are, the, the higher your standard of living is, the more you say, well, what I have, this is, I need this. You know, I, I have to have seven homes. Are you kidding? How can I not have seven homes? I have, I'm, that's what I'm used to. Now, buckle yourselves for what he's about to say. Brace yourselves for what he's about to say. Know that necessity calls only calls for food and clothing. Okay, so that's the first thing that he says. If you want to talk about necessity, necessity is only in clothes because you can't walk around naked, and food because you have to eat so you don't die. If you were to abandon beautification regarding clothes, then two dinars a year would suffice you for both winter and summer, with which you would buy a garment of rough material to protect you from the heat and the cold. Forget about the two dinar. I mean, because that's sort of time and place but let's say you know like 200 bucks is enough for your clothing allowance for the year if you if you abandon indulging in your food and satiation with food under all circumstance then a mud every day is enough for you the mud that's what we give zakat al fitr that amount of money so let's say 10 bucks 12 bucks of food allotment per day is enough for you. That would be 500 rit every year, which is just sort of a, a measurement uh, times the, the, the days of the year. Approximately three dinars a year are enough for you in regards to condiments, assuming that prices are low. And now we know that there's inflation, right? So prices are high. If not, then a few dinars are, five dinars are sufficient. 500 rit is what we approximate for the bachelor. If you have a family, then take for each member that amount. So he's saying what I just told you, 200 bucks a year for clothes, $10 a day for food, you and your family. So if you're a family of five, you, you don't need more than 50 bucks for food worth a day and a thousand dollars of clothes. You know, uh, we don't live like that. I mean, we probably spend all of that, you know, in an, you know, three times a day or something like that. So he's saying, if you want to talk about Necessity, well, why don't you think about actually what is necessity, meaning that you're not going to perish. If you are an earner, what he means by an earner is that if you have a job, like you, you earn a living, you're a tradesperson, or you're, in our case, you're professional or whatever, and make in a day what suffices you for that day, then turn your attention and preoccupy yourself with worship. So in the traditional marketplace, what people used to do is they would buy and you know they would have their shop open from the morning and they would sell and it would be very common that by the afternoon they would close their shop this idea of like the, the shop is open 24 7 it wasn't necessarily the case why because khalas alhamdulillah i made enough i sold enough for today now i'm going to go to the masjid you know and and pray a little bit or read some quran if you are not an earner but are busy with studying or worship and have acquired some property that constantly generates income, then I hope that you do not become a worldly person, especially in these times when hearts have changed. Imam al Ghazali is talking about his time, you know, the, the sixth century. In any, case, in any case, acquiring this income is more appropriate than asking, meaning asking for a hand me out, yet on condition that it is your desire to be free from subjugation to hunger and cold so that you may leave the property, also that you do not dislike death and do not love property. The property should be the entry point of your food, just as the outhouse is its point of exit. You must only want it out of necessity and desire to be free of it, so as to get out of the prohibition in the Prophet's statement, do not take a villa and thus love the world. Indeed, if you intend to rid yourself of it, 
in order to support religion, then you are a well-prepared traveler, not someone overly concerned with property. Okay, now this is you know very startling. I mean, this is very extreme, of course. And that's why I said in the beginning, you can substitute what Imam al-Ghazali is saying about like having one garment you know, in your life and a year and that kind of thing by simply asking yourself this question, do I need to get this? Do I have to have this right now? And that's a good question to ask yourself before you go out for a meal, before you buy something for yourself. This question is not meant to make you miserable. He's, he's not saying to do this and to be miserable. But all of this is under the chapter heading of stinginess, because we do not want to become stingy. So just hang on until the end of the chapter, which is very close. Perhaps some people would not have the ability to be satisfied with the amount we have mentioned, you know, i.e. all of us, except with extreme difficulty and hardship. There is no harm, religiously speaking, in doubling the amount for it would not turn one to a, into a child of the world, nor remove one from the par party of the children of the afterlife traveling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so long as one intends thereby to repel the pain of hunger that could distract one from remembrance and worship without indulging in the world. So if you are too poor, you are going to be, your life will be dominated by poverty. And that's why people who become wealthy, oftentimes they come from very impoverished backgrounds because the extreme poverty or you know any level of sub sub sufficient level of living you become obsessed with getting enough and what does that do it distracts you from worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there are two extremes there's the extreme of not having enough at all and having too much so when it when you when it's about lessening the measuring stick is what do I, what can I reduce? Sorry, when it's about lessening, what can I reduce such that that reduction doesn't distract me from worship? So if you're always wearing, you know, a jeans and a ripped t-shirt in our society, you're going to be, eventually you're going to be very self-conscious. If you're so self-conscious at what you're wearing and it's not appropriate enough, then you have gone too low because you're not worried, focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to have enough that you are, fo you are comfortable and able to focus. If you have too much, like if you, like, you know, I have a couple of nice things and every time I wear them, I'm so concerned that it gets stained, that it gets ripped. That's wrong, right? Because then I'm just sort of, just, I'm so stupid. I'm distracted by what I'm wearing. So I ask myself, why did I wear it or buy it in the first place? You know, if I'm just so, I'm so worried about it then I become distracted with the thing, or if it's too low, I'm distracted with not having the thing. So there's got to be a middle way, and that middle way we arrive by asking ourselves those questions. And each one of us will have our middle way. Indulgence is a turning away from Allah Ta'ala and a preoccupation with this world, indulgence in material things. As for charity, abandoning wealth is better than it. As Isa alayhi salam, Christ said alayhi salam, O seeker of the world, O seeker of the world for virtue's sake, for you to leave it is twice as virtuous. So somebody might say, no, I want to get money so I can give. So Imam al-Ghazali is saying, actually, it's better just have less and be content. If Allah so chooses to give you, then you can give. As for preparation due to fear of a calamity, there is nothing that can repel it when it is a bad opinion that has no end. Rather, one should repel it with a good opinion of Allah Ta'ala's plan. That means picturing that a calamity will befall one's wealth from where it is not expected. And at the same time, picturing that a new door of provision will open from where one does not expect it. So one of the uh, tools in ancient philosophy is to contemplate negative outcomes. And by contemplating the negative outcome, like in this case, you know, that I become, I lose my job or I lose my savings. The idea is that by experiencing that feeling before it actually happens, you are prepared, God forbid, if that thing should happen. But Islam adds a, a, a secondary teaching to that practice, which is at the same time, rather than be miserable and just constantly think of bad things that can happen to you, immediately think Allah has closed one door and will open up another. And that's, that's Islam's added value to that practice. It's a very common practice you find in ancient 
uh, you know, uh, Western philosophy and, and, and other places as well, is to contemplate what might befall you and therefore, you know, being content with what we would say qadr. And that's fine, but Islam adds another teaching and at the same time have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has closed the door but will open another one. And that's why he quotes this verse from Surah al talaq if the rare opposite is supposed, a slave should not believe that lifelong security from all trials is praiseworthy. Rather, trial is what polishes, purifies, and rids the heart of all filthy things. I want to underline that. I like that quote a lot. Let me read that again. If the rare opposite is supposed, a slave should not believe that lifelong security from all trials is praiseworthy. Why? Because rather trial, difficulties, is what polishes, purifies, and rids the heart of all filthy things. In Arabic, we call the difficulty al-mihna. It's a difference, a trial. And then we say with this mihna comes a minha. With it, and you, by reversing some of the letters, you get a new opportunity. So as difficult as trials and tribulations are, and you know, boy, can they be difficult, at the end of them, there is this cleansing and this purity. For this reason, it is assigned to the prophets, then the saints, then whoever is most like them. As we know, that the MBA the are the ones who are most tried and those closest to them. Therefore, rely upon the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that nothing befalls you except that there is good in it for truly the planner of creation and all of its dimensions is more knowledgeable of what is in your welfare. Wealth is like medicine. What we have mentioned is an approximation. Increasing or decreasing it is possible according to the endeavor of some people and in some states. However, you should believe absolutely, and this is the key, you should believe absolutely that wealth is like medicine. A specific dosage of it is what benefits. Overdosing kills, and getting close to an overdose will cause one to be ill, though it does not kill. So be careful and take only a little, and avoid overdosing on luxury, for it is certainly a great danger. There's only a small element of efficiency, oh, sorry, there's only a small element of difficulty in having less for a few days. It is not hard on a prudent person to deprive himself for the sake of a feast in paradise, due to his knowledge that the degree of future pleasant, uh, pleasure is commensurate to the degree of hunger in the present. So it's like medicine. And one place to start, in addition to the you know, questioning yourself, is to be content with what you have now. And to practice that and to say, Alhamdulillah, when you, when you get something to eat, when you get something to drink, you bought a new article of clothing, even if it's, you know, underwear or socks or whatever. But to say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah that I have this. You know, there are people that can't even afford to have socks or shoes or whatever. Alhamdulillah. That teaches you to be content. So one of the, one of the things that Imam al-Ghazali I mean, he'll talk about elsewhere in the book, but th that's related specifically to this idea of wealth is the idea of contentment. If you are content with what you have and abruptly you get, you know, somebody gives you a gift or something like that, say, oh my, I'm so overwhelmed by this gift, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Most likely you're not going to abuse it. You're going to most likely do something positive with it. But if you are always trying to keep up with the Joneses, if you're always trying, I remember I, I had, a, uh, I was still in the PhD years and I was transitioning back from Princeton to DC. And I remember we were uh, living uh, not too far from the center, but not where I am now. And I remember I had this young guy, he was about my age. Uh, and he had this, these two Porsches. And all day long, every day, he'd like polish them and wax them. And, you know, when the sun was out, he'd like bring the car out and, you know, he'd like, you know, make sure that the windows. And I remember all of the, uh, all of the neighbors, you know, we we're all pretty much more or less in the same age bracket. 
So all of the all the guys, of course, you come out and be like, oh wow, that's amazing. He's like, yeah, you know, he's like standing by his Porsche. He's so he's so proud. And you know, people would ask questions, and and what that does is, if you're not prepared for that, it can it can put pressure on you. And you're like, you look at your car. Look, my car sucks compared to this guy's car. Now, this guy was clear that this was his passion. All of his extra money went into these two cars, you know, and and he he loved these cars with with every ounce of his being. And there are people like that. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, but the, what's, what's wrong is if you start to compare what he has to what you have, you know, that's why we say keeping up with the Joneses. So you look at your neighbor, the Joneses, oh, they got a new car, we need a new car. Oh, they wanted this vacation, we need to go on a better vacation. And you keep going up and up and up and up until you can't sustain it. So you need to practice it, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, we are secure. Alhamdulillah, we are safe. Alhamdulillah, we have something to eat. And you have to start saying that and look below you, beneath you, to those who have less than you. That's a very, very important part in trying to implement this concept of wealth being like a medicine, is you need to learn and practice to be grateful for what you have. Even if you're struggling, still say Alhamdulillah. Okay, so Imam Ghazali, he's going to conclude the chapter where we began with what is the stinginess business. Perhaps you desire to know the definition of stinginess, for an individual may doubt as to whether or not he is stingy and people differ about it. Know that the definition of stinginess is to prevent what the revealed law or public respectability obligates. So if the Sharia tells you you have to pay zakat with fit in Ramadan before the Eid, you pay it. You don't think twice about it. You don't, you, you don't say, oh, why is our masjid approximating zakat al fitr at $15 and the other masjid down the street, they're appro approximating at 10, I'm gonna go give my zakat al fitr to the mosque that's less. Or you're going to buy a funeral shroud, a kefan for yourself and your family, just in case you know somebody dies. And then you go to buy it and then and you start haggling with the guy over the price. Yeah, you, you're, this is a, the, the last outfit you're gonna wear and this is not the time to haggle over the price. It's supposed to remind you of death, you know, or, or whatever, you're going to buy a burial spot, you know, so the, mas the mosque has these burial sp spots and you're going to, to buy it and then you start arguing with the brother or sister, eh, it's too expensive, right? Because these are things that we're supposed to do, we're supposed to be prepared for death, so on and so forth, or what is respectable. Um, so sometimes there are just things that are proprietary, right? Uh, you know, somebody in the community, one of the kids, uh, reads the Quran in a beautiful way, or they conclude the recitation of the Quran or something. So as a community, we want to support them and give them a gift. You know, so you give them something, you give them something, it doesn't have to be extravagant, but that's considered normal. Uh, if you hear that somebody just got married or you hear somebody that just had a child, it's considered normal that you give them a gift. If you have a problem with that, that's considered normal, Imam al-Ghazali is saying that's the first sign that you're stingy. Uh, do not think that someone who submits to his wife or his relative with the judge, sorry, or his relative what the judge has dictated but is uptight about giving a morsel beyond this is not stingy. Do not think either that someone who returns a piece of bread or meat to the baker or butcher because of a slight deficiency is not stingy. Even if he has a right to do so legally speaking for the meaning of the revealed law in regards to these matters is to end the dispute of stingy people over an amount that the stingy person can bear. This is why Allah Ta'ala says, Inyas al kumuha fayuhfikum tabkhaloon. If he were to ask you for it and press you, you would be stingy. So even though some things might be technically correct, they still can be a sign of stinginess. Indeed, it is necessary to comply with respectability and refute those who would speak ill and that differs according to the differences of people and the amount of wealth. If someone has wealth and is able to prevent his disparagement and censure by a poet with a small amount, yet he does not do it, then he is stingy, even if it was not obligatory upon him. The Prophet ﷺ said, whatever a person protect, whenever, whatever a person protects his honors with is charity. So you have the ability to, to prevent somebody slandering you, and that requires you to pay for something or do something, and then you don't do it, like, I don't care about my reputation. That's a sign that you're stingy because you know, who, wouldn't, who, who would openly allow their reputation to be harmed? To verify, 
Wealth was created for a benefit and is possessed for that sake. There is also a benefit in spending it. Whenever the benefit of spending appears to be greater than the benefit of holding, yet it is difficult for a person to spend, then he is a stingy person who loves wealth. Wealth should not be loved for itself, but rather for its benefit. Therefore, it should be di directed to the strongest of its benefits. Preservation of public respectability is better and stronger than indulging in much eating, for example. Stinginess and love of wealth could lead to a person becoming ignorant of the strongest and most appropriate of two benefits. This is the utmost stinginess. If he knows yet spending is still difficult on him, then he is also stingy. And if he spends, even if he spends effectively. Rather, a person frees himself from stinginess only when spending wealth on what it should be spent on rationally and legally does not weigh heavily on him. As for the level of liberal generosity, only spending in excess of both legal obligation and public respectability attains it. Okay, and then lastly, what is the treatment for stinginess? Perhaps you would like to understand the treatment of stinginess. Know that it is re its remedy is a mixture composed of knowledge and practice, as he said with all problems, knowledge and practice. As for knowledge, it is that you know the destruction in store for the stingy person in the afterlife, and the censure connected to him in the world. It is also for you to know that wealth, assuming that it remains, does not follow you to your grave. Wealth is only for Allah Ta'ala. He enables one to possess it in order to use it for the important matters. It is also for you to know that being spoken well of and receiving a reward in the afterlife is more delightful than withholding wealth for the sake of indulging in desires. Merely fulfilling desires is the na nature of dumb beasts, while the former is the nature of rational people. If a person holds on to wealth for the sake of leaving it for his child, then it is as if he le leaves him in goodness only to punish himself forward to his Lord with evil, to push himself forward to his Lord with evil. This is the essence of ignorance. How is this so? If his child is righteous, then Allah Ta'ala is enough for him. If he is a sinner, then he relies upon wealth to commit acts of disobedience, and the parent is the cause of the child's in empowerment to do them. Thus, he is harmed while other indulges. And actually, a lot of wealthy people, when they leave money for their children, they, they oftentimes stipulate that their children are not able to access the money until they are sometimes quite old. And the, the thinking behind that is that if they have an influx of money when they're too young, it can destroy them. And this is a, you know, this is a common problem and, and, and has le led to common problems in the past. As for practice, it is that a person forces himself to spend and does not cease to do so until it becomes a habit for him. Among a person's loopholes regarding that, this is that he should be duped by expectation of a good name and anticipation of a recompense until he desires to spend. Thereafter, he graduates to subduing these qualities, meaning that give and don't worry about what people say, give so that the giving is purely done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la wa'ala. Thank you Any very questions? much for uh, making us understand this uh, and elaborate and iteration and from this iteration of all this. Does it um, uh, in Arabic mean bakhil, bakhil? Does it mean bakhil in Arabic? Yes, this is yeah, the section of bukh to be stingy. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa uh, I have a question. Um, you said uh, necessity basically is uh, clothing and food. I know um, uh, uh, living in a house, that's necessity. But my question is, it will come to interest. When we buy bigger houses that are way too big for us and buy expensive cars and pay interest on that, is that why? If I understand you correctly, maybe in the past you said interest on house is wajib? Or is it because of no. necessity? No, no, we're talking about two different things. From the legal point of view, financing a house, financing a car, th those transactions are halal. That, that's something separate. That, that's a legal matter. What Imam al Ghazali is talking about, it's he's, he's trying to help train us not to be attached to the things that we have. So in order to do that, he's making this you know, shocking statement and, and say, 
If you think that what you have is necessity, let me tell you what is actual necessity by definition of the word is that you eat and you have clothes. Other than that, nothing is really necessary. Now, of course, he's not saying go live like that, but he's, he's using this as a teaching device to get you to start to think about what you have. So it's not, this is not an issue of halal and haram. This is an issue of what's the right way to live, how not to be attached to our things, so on and so forth. Do you understand? All right, I understand, but when you do halal and haram, if we go by excesses house, paying interest, I know I'm talking to two different things, but that's my thinking about is more interest, you know, because we know what is good for us. That, in, that interest on financing the house is not haram to start out with. So that, that argument doesn't work. Okay. The, the argument that you, you could make is if you buy a house that's so expensive that you cannot pay your payments. Okay. then that would be more along the lines of what Imam al-Ghazali is talking for. But if something is halal, then it's halal. We can't, we can't make the halal a haram and make the haram halal. If, if purchasing a house, financing a house, financing a car, if that's permissible. If you are, and that money is halal and you are able to afford it, then I can't say, oh, that's haram. But Imam al-Ghazali is saying something else. Is that the right thing for you to do? Or would it be better to be content with what you have? Those are the questions that he wants us to start to ask ourselves. Okay. Well, I also work real hard to make a lot of money because I know what I want to do with it back home. There are a lot of kids who don't have nothing, no clothes, no school, kind of so, so help in my community. That's what it is. Alhamdulillah, we, we need to support one another and that's, you know, that's part of it. So almost everyone that's in our mosque and on our network, you know, people are professionals and highly educated. So uh, Allah Ta'ala has given you those tools. So use them. So I, I, he's not saying become poor. That's not the message. The message is not attaching yourself to it. Right. Okay. There's a trend, at least in some circles, against accumulating possessions and instead accumulating experiences. Do these principles apply equally to both areas? For example, I would love to travel the world with my family to experience different cultures, but it's certainly not necessary. Um, no, I, the principles are not necessarily the same because there are great... Um, there are great benefits in traveling, specifically. And um, one of the things that Imam al-Ghazali, I mean, not in this book, but in, in some of his other, one of the things that Imam al-Ghazali talks about is he talks about, for the ulama that are engaging in the process of ijtihad, he talks about the importance of creativity and the ability for the mujtahid to be able to sort of postulate in his mind or her mind what might happen in the future. And all that kind of thing. And he said that the mujtahid ijtihad is only going to be as good as, as is their creativity. One of the problems with people that don't travel and are not exposed to different cultures and is that they have a, you know, they're very almost two dimensional. I'm not going to say that you have to travel. I'm not going to go that far, but there's certainly the Quran talks about travel. The Prophet Sassan himself talked about travel. Um, this is one of the, it's a form of meditation. You know, it's a form of tafakkur. When Allah Ta'ala tells us to see and to, to ponder the heavens and the earth and, and to contemplate the people before us, what's befallen them and, and things like that, uh, it was, it, it's a function of travel. Um, uh, Edward Gibbon, for example, when he traveled as a young man to Rome, sitting in the ruins of a Roman temple, uh, he said it was at that moment that I, I, the desire to write the decline and fall of the Roman empire happened. I'm so glad he went on that trip because that's one of the greatest books ever written, you know, six volumes that talks about the rise and, or the decline and fall of the Roman empire. In the last half of the book, it's basically the interaction with the Roman empire and Islam because it ultimately fell with the fall of Constantinople. So, I mean, you know, all of that is because he, was, he just traveled and he, he physically was somewhere that he's, he's known about rationally, but he saw it. So I would say it's different. I don't, I don't think that this is necessary. It can be extravagant the way people travel sometimes. Uh, maybe one can make an argument for that, especially if, you know, people go into debt for it or, or whatnot. But if your intention is right and you think about some of these things that I've mentioned, it's like a form of meditation and contemplation, I think travel could be phenomenal, especially for young kids to give them that exposure. In addition, many of us, um, we're all American, but many of us have families that come from other parts of the world. 
and also keeping family ties and letting them experience the culture of, of their parents or their grandparents or their great grandparents is also important. Uh, there is something that is unlocked when a person reconnects with their origin, with their ancestry. Uh, it gives them, uh, they become a more authentic version of themselves. It gives them a sense, you know, they understand the family history and so on and so forth. So I think that I would, I would put them in almost completely different categories uh, for that reason. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I will end with our, with our salawat. Allahumma salli afdala salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama dhakaraka al-dhakirun wa ghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafilun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.